Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar, the channel where you can learn about new concepts in physics and astronomy. I'm your host, Dr. Robotai. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the premier observation relative to our Sun, the solar spectrum, or the white light which it emits. The solar spectrum also represents the most compelling proof that the photosphere is composed of condensed matter. In this figure, you can see a graphical representation of the light emitted by our Sun. The horizontal axis gives different wavelengths of the Sun's light. The vertical axis represents the intensity of the light, also known as the solar irradiance. The solar spectrum is the solid line. The total light that the Sun is emitted is represented by the area under the curve. Importantly, the spectrum of the Sun appears to closely match that of the spectrum of black bodies on Earth as shown by the dotted line. This has been known since the days of Samuel Langley when he first measured the spectrum with great precision in the 1880s. Because the spectra of the Sun and black bodies are so similar, it is vital in dealing with the solar spectrum to take into consideration what is known to produce a black body spectrum on Earth. As a result, it is key to know a little relative to Kirchhoff's law black bodies in their spectra as presented in this video. If you haven't watched it, give it a view first. The section of the solar spectrum which we can see with our eyes corresponds to the optical region of the electromagnetic spectrum. At the upper end of the electromagnetic spectrum, the wavelengths are shorter, while at the lower end, they are longer. We give different sections of the electromagnetic spectrum names to help us remember the wavelengths and the frequencies which are present in those regions. Note how the frequency and the wavelengths change with the type of light. Frequency has units of hertz or cycles per second, while wavelengths can be expressed in meters. For electromagnetic waves, frequency times wavelength is known to equal the speed of light. The solar spectrum manifests how much light is emitted by our star at each wavelength. Since the solar spectrum is continuous with this particular shape, we see that the Sun is emitting white light. Optically, white light is a mixture of light of different wavelengths. If you've ever held a prism up to the sunlight, you've seen that we can break up the light into its component colors. You can resolve the spectrum into red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet light. The exact same effect is observed in a rainbow. Rainbows are produced by water droplets, which act as small prisms in the sky. To the left of the optical region, we have the shorter wavelengths, first the ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma-ray regions. These last two are not part of the thermal spectrum of the Sun. To the right of the optical region comes the infrared, microwave, and radio wave. Once again, the last two are not really considered part of the solar spectrum. As we talked about our video on the history of the gaseous Sun, Men like Secchi and Fay wanted the presence of condensed matter on the photosphere in order to account for the white light emitted by the Sun. That was because in the laboratory, scientists knew that gases don't emit continuous spectra, but instead emit in bands. We are all familiar with neon lights. Neon lights are made by filling glass tubes with different gases and then exciting the gas with electricity. Each gas produces light of a different color. Neon emits orange colored light, hydrogen red, helium yellow, mercury blue. The Sun and the stars are known to be mostly hydrogen, but the Sun appears as nearly white, not red. That is why, even up to the early part of the 20th century, many of the leading observational astronomers refused to accept the idea that the Sun could be treated as a gas. Eventually though, under the pressure of increasingly complex theoretical models, they yielded to the idea. However, they should have held their ground. Why did the theoretical physicists come to carry the day? It all stems from the mid-1800s when Gustav Kirchhoff proposed his new law. Remember, Kirchhoff's law has to do with black bodies. In the old days, these were objects covered with soot. Eventually, the objects became more sophisticated. Black bodies were then built from graphite. If arbitrary walls were used instead of graphite, they often contained at least a little piece of graphite or their interior was coated with lamp black. Alternatively, another very good absorber could have been used to line the walls of the cavity. 
In any case, Kirchhoff's law, as you remember from this video, states that the light contained in an enclosed opaque cavity must always depend only on the temperature and be independent of the nature of the walls of the cavity itself. The dotted line superimposed upon the solar spectrum actually constitutes a theoretical fit using Planck's equation for black bodies. It is from this relationship that scientists assign a temperature of 5,700 degrees to the photosphere of the Sun. However, Max Planck himself objected to setting an absolute temperature to the photosphere based on the use of his equation. Still, it does seem like the photosphere acts as a black body. But the black body laws were formulated using solid cavities, which did not have any convection or conduction. So how can we apply these ideas to the Sun, where we know that convection and conduction currents exist? Let's make a statement. When the spectrum has the same appearance as a black body on Earth and is reporting the correct temperature, we will say that the radiation is black or normal. However, there are instances when the temperature reported is only apparent and not real. It is not a representation of the total energy at the site of emission. Then we can say that the spectrum is thermal. It is not black or normal. It still has some relationship to black body radiation, but for some reasons which will become clear in later videos, the temperature is not correct. Planck might have hinted at this when he spoke about the Sun and said, Now the apparent temperature of the Sun is obviously nothing but the temperature of the solar rays, depending entirely on the nature of the rays, and hence a property of the rays and not a property of the Sun itself. Therefore, it would be not only more convenient, but also more correct, to apply this notation directly, instead of speaking of a fictitious temperature of the Sun, which can be made to have meaning only by the introduction of an assumption that does not hold in reality. In our next video, we will explain how modern astronomy accounts for the production of the solar spectrum in a gaseous sun, and outline the problems with these approaches. Eventually, you will learn how the production of the solar spectrum is one of the clearest signs that the photosphere is composed of condensed matter. This will be discussed in this presentation. As this series continues, we will revisit Kirchhoff's law in detail and come to discover its effects on modern astrophysics. I hope that you like this short exposition relative to the solar spectrum and will join me once again as we look more closely at the Sun, the stars, and beyond. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. In addition, subscribe if you want to journey with me through space here at Sky Scholar. Comments are always welcome down below. I'll see you soon on our next video.